Uh, this is uh, the title of the, project, of the program, as you know, is The Gaza War, uh, a different perspective or a different approach to understanding the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, the, the, for, uh, each speaker uh, will uh, make remarks informed by a very unusual and important book that they have co-authored that's recently come out. Uh, it integrates a number of different perspectives that explore the dynamics leading to and shaping events around the conflict. One of these dimensions is uh, regional and international system developments. Another is the domestic political situation in each of the participating actors, each of the countries or the, the, the actors. And a third is uh, the characteristics of the leaders themselves of the countries and actors that are, are participating. Uh, the name of the book is Arabs and Israelis, Conflict and Peacemaking in the Middle East. Uh, I urge you all to uh, look it up and, and find it. And we're fortunate to have uh, not only the authors, but have them taking this approach and bringing together this unusual perspective in a discussion of events during the past summer and more broadly. The, spe the three speakers are uh, uh, Dr. Khalil Shikaki. He's director of the Palestine Center for Policy and Survey Research in, Mar in, in Ramallah. He's a senior fellow at the Brandeis Crown Center for Middle East Studies as well. And he's currently, I'm happy to say, a visiting scholar here at Michigan, spending the semester at the University of Michigan, uh, as well as part of the time at Brandeis, uh, on a Carnegie grant that we we're fortunate to have. <coughs> also speaking is Professor Shai Feldman. He's the Judith and Sidney Schwartz Prof uh, Director of the Brandeis, Center for, uh, the Brandeis uh, Crown Center for Middle East Studies. He's also a senior fellow and a member of the Board of Directors of Harvard's Belfair Center for, International, uh, for Science and International Affairs. And finally, uh, Dr. Abdelmonim Said Ali. He's chairman of the board and CEO and director of the Regional Center for Strategic Studies in Cairo. He's also a senior fellow at the Brandeis Crown Center. Uh, the program is sponsored. I want to give uh, acknowledge the, uh, the, our ability to have this program. Uh, we have support from the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies here at UWM, from the Frankel Cent Center for Judaic Studies, from the International Institute, as John mentioned, from the Ford School and the International Policy Center. Uh, we thank our sponsors very much, and we're very much looking forward to your remarks. Sure. Can you hear me? Good, okay. So what I'm going to do um, is give you a little bit of a sense uh, of, uh, of our enterprise, which is to say the, the, the book that uh, Mark uh, was so kind to, uh, to mention, um, as a way of introducing you to the way we approach questions like what can be expected uh, now uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the aftermath uh, of, uh, of the Gaza, uh, what sometimes uh, people refer to as the third Gaza war or the third Hamas-Israeli uh, war. Uh, actually, the history, which I'll go through very quickly, uh, of this enterprise begins uh, 10 years ago when uh, we established the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis and decided to do uh, something different uh, in the sense that uh, we insisted that the center would be based on the principle of being balanced and dispassionate. And that means that we created the center, a center that attempts to reflect the different perspectives and the different views uh, <coughs> from the region and about the region. And so when I was asked to uh, create the center, I approached uh, two uh, individuals, colleagues of mine, uh, with whom uh, I've interacted for the previous uh, three and a half decades in the case of, of Abdul Munim and two and a half decades in the case of Khalil, and asked them uh, to join uh, and to give me a bit of their time, uh, and they both agreed to join. So we were the sort of the founding trio uh, that created uh, the center 10 years ago. And when we discussed uh, what kind of content uh, we would uh, insert into this kind of a unique uh, 
uh, collaboration, uh, we decided to create a class that, again, we didn't think there were many precedents uh, for. Uh, a class on the Arab-Israeli conflict that's team taught by an Israeli, a Palestinian, uh, and an Egyptian presenting a broader uh, Arab perspective. And two of us are in class, every class. Normally, uh, we deal with the regional dimension or the state-to-state -state dimension of the conflict, so Abdul Munim is uh, there first, and uh, we are in class, every class, for the first half of the semester. And then we deal with the Israeli-Palestinian dimension. Uh, Abdul Munim goes back to Cairo, Khalil comes from Ramallah, and the two of us are in class every class. So the students can get uh, not only a sense of the texts that are available uh, regarding the history of the conflict, but also by interacting with us, uh, the texture of the conflict. And then following that, we decided to translate that unique experience into uh, the first textbook uh, on the conflict that's co-authored by an Israeli, a Palestinian, and an Egyptian. And this textbook that managed, uh, the work on which managed to ruin six of our summers, um, uh, finally, uh, finally came out uh, about 10 months ago. And uh, the book basically, um, all the, it's a 13 chapter book for a 13 week American semester. Uh, and all the chapters have the same structure. Uh, and that is that the first third of every chapter is called main developments. We could have called it the uncontested history which is to say that part of the history of the conflict and the history of the efforts to resolve the conflict that is not contested. Uh, so these are basically developments uh, in the history of the conflict regarding which there isn't a big war of interpretations between, uh, between the protagonists to the conflict. Um, how do we know that these are not contested? Because we agreed. <laughs> uh, so by definition, uh, these are uncontested. Now, of course, uh, when you... In, in talking to certain audiences, we found out that not everything we agreed about um, is completely agreed about, but I would say if 90% if is agreed upon, uh, that's fine. The second uh, third of all the chapters uh, is divided into three parts again, and, and that is about everything that is contested. And as you know, actually the surprising thing, uh, one of the scholars that commented on the book in London said, hey, you know, it's actually quite surprising that there's a third of every chapter that's not contested. Uh, and actually, we didn't actually think about it, but when, when he said it, we realized, hey, that's true. We did manage to write a third of every chapter uh, on, the history, on the parts of the history that uh, were not contested. The second third actually provides uh, the reader with what is the Israeli uh, narrative, what's the Palestinian narrative, what's the, what are broader Arab narratives, but also what are specific narratives, Arab narratives, because there are junctures in the conflict where there's a big gap between the Palestinian narrative and Arab narratives, and there are also periods in the conflict where there is a gap between Arab narratives. So if you take uh, the 1970 uh, so-called Black September and the history of the Syrian intervention in Jordan, well, believe me, there is a very different Syrian narrative about that and the Jordanian narrative about the same development. So, and then the third, provides the students uh, or the readers with a toolbox. Uh, we call it analysis, which means that's the analytical part of, of, the, of the chapters. And essentially, the intention here is to provide the reader, the student. Uh, we've been teaching, as I said, this class now for, we're in the middle of teaching this the 10th time. Uh, to provide the students a toolbox uh, that they can use two years from now, three years from now, when they read something uh, if people will still be reading anything, uh, or they get a tweet, uh, and they'll try to figure out, you know, what's caused this thing that now appeared in this uh, tweet. Tweet would probably be outmoded by the time uh, this happens two years from now. Uh, but the, so basically, the toolbox is simple. It tells the students that in order to understand any uh, development in the history of the conflict, whether it's whether we try to understand the causes of that development or we try to understand the consequences of that development. And, and when we'll talk about, after Gaza, we'll talk about an example of a consequence. The students have to answer for themselves four questions. Number one, which goes along the line of what Mark uh, mentioned a few minutes ago. Number one is, what in the international arena happened during this period that can explain that development in the conflict. The second is what happened in the region 
uh, that can explain uh, what happened in the conflict. The third is what happened in the domestic politics of the protagonists that can explain uh, what happened uh, in the conflict. And finally, uh, what's the role of individual leaders? Uh, what's agency uh, do individual leaders have or had uh, that can explain uh, what happened uh, in the history of the conflict? So I'll end my contribution to uh, this, in, these introductory <coughs> remarks by, by saying that if I try to answer these four questions and trying to understand the consequences or where we are now, sometimes we refer to it in the Middle East as the situation, if I try to understand the situation, uh, I w with, with a specific question of, okay, we've now, we're now past uh, this last episode, of, of, uh, and, and to call it an episode is an understatement, 51 days of, of warfare, um, what are going to be the determinants of the, consequence, uh, of the consequences of, of, of that? So let me just spend uh, just a few minutes uh, giving you a sense, or my sense, uh, and uh, then, of course, my colleagues will, um, will correct me. The beauty of dealing with something that, hasn't, that happened after we closed the textbook is, is that we can all disagree. Um, so what, what's the story here uh, in terms of where, where do we go from here on the conflict? Well, what is the story, first of all, on the global level? Uh, this is a period which is actually quite unique uh, in the history of the conflict. If you look at the conflict over the last six or seven decades, there have been very few periods where the international arena didn't affect uh, the conflict. So if in the 1950s uh, we had one extreme case, which is a conflict under the umbrella of the Cold War, under the umbrella of the US-Soviet rivalry, under the umbrella of other things happening in the global arena, like the declining power of Britain and France, without which you would not have had the conspiracy of the 56 war. This is a period, actually, where the global arena is absent, in the sense that the only remaining superpower, the US, has, for the last year and a half, two years, checked out, practically checked out. Uh, so we are now under, uh, after the second effort of the Obama administration to do something about the conflict, an administration that's burned twice, and for the past months uh, it's basically been absent, and it's absent, largely absent uh, now. So that's number one. On the regional level, I would say uh, a couple of interesting. One is, this is again a period that's <laughs> unprecedented. Uh, in, in the sense of, this is, a, this is a very, very, very different region than the region that we've known in the 50s and 60s uh, and 70s. Uh, whether it was under the uh, Cold War, whether it was the so-called Arab Cold War uh, between uh, revolutionaries and reactionaries, between Republicans and monarchies and so on and so forth, these were periods where there was some governing principle uh, or organizing principle that, the region, uh, that organized the region. Right now, at least if there is some organizing principle, I can't find it. Uh, there are so many uh, rivalries right now and, and uh, divisions going on in the Middle East right now that I would say this is, a, this is almost the, the other extreme, a, a very, very chaotic, uh, chaotic uh, region. Now, how does that affect the conflict? It affects the conflict. I will just say a word about how this affects on the Israeli side. Uh, on the Israeli side, there are two kind of there is, a, there is an effect and there is a potential effect. The effect is that this is a region that Israelis don't understand, but, Israel, it, but they frighten Israelis. There's so much uncertainty and there's so much slaughter around, uh, whether it's 200,000 people getting slaughtered in Syria, uh, other struggles and so on and so forth. There is a tendency in the center of the map, the political map in Israel, which is, of course belongs to the third question, to hunker down. Uh, and to say, wait a minute, this is a region we don't understand, it's full of risks, and so on and so forth, we're not going to take any more risks for peace. At the same time, this is a region that presents Israel with unprecedented opportunities, because the, the Middle East is now more consumed by other issues, and there is a greater tendency or willingness to see Israel as just another player in the region, and actually to cooperate with Israel, whether it's, um, it's uh, cooperation with Egypt over risks emanating from the Sinai, whether it's cooperation with Jordan over risks in southern Syria and ISIS and so on and so forth, 
uh, Israel actually has an opportunity to become a partner in the region. Now, of course, we all understand, at least some of us understand, that that requires something from Israel in relationship to the Palestinians, and that then begs the question of, you know, is Israel prepared to do its share to uh, utilize or exploit this new regional uh, environment? So that's number, that's as far as the region is concerned. Um, one more, the, the issue of Israel-Hamas relationship kind of belongs in, the, in, in, in sort of a, a middle ground between the regional uh, and, uh, and the domestic. And I'll just mention something from, again, from an Israeli perspective, uh, and Khalil will, will provide you definitely with a different, uh, another perspective. Uh, and again, this is just very telegraphic. Hamas wrote a narrative of victory after these 51 days uh, of, uh, of fighting. And, um, and I won't get into the details. Actually, Hamas has grounds uh, for writing a narrative of victory, and without, we can get into the details. Paradoxically, I would say that uh, many Israelis buy into uh, the, the Hamas narrative and see the, the Israeli performance in these 51 days as as leaving something to be desired. And actually many Israelis, including the chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, has, have expressed admiration uh, for Hamas's performance uh, in these 51 uh, days. And that is a great gain for Hamas, which of course Khalil will emphasize. I'm not sure that in the long range it's actually a gain for the Palestinians. Because, because again, what the impact of this on the Israeli domestic front is it made Israelis more fearful. It basically said to the people in the Israeli center, my God, you know, if we had to face these kinds of threats, not from Gaza, but from the West Bank, where, which is proximate to 80% of the population and uh, proximate to where 80% of Israel's GDP is produced, uh, we would be in, in, in bad trouble. And that, all, again, plays a role into uh, the, making the Israeli domestic scene uh, more fearful uh, of making the concessions that are necessary uh, to move uh, towards some resolution of the conflict. So that brings us to the Israeli domestic front, and I would say about this two things. Number one is all of these things I've already mentioned have caused, in my view, a turn to the right, not turn to the ideological, historical right, but turn to the more security right. Um, and, and the other aspect of this is a very problematic governmental coalition. Uh, that makes every, any, any effort at progress uh, very, very, very difficult. And so that brings us now to the question of, does Israel have the leadership uh, that can actually do something dramatic uh, to take uh, this conflict to a much better uh, situation? And unfortunately, with this, I have to share with you that my answer is highly unlikely. Uh, highly unlikely because... Uh, the Israeli prime minister is not the kind of prime minister that, had, that has the characteristics or the personality traits uh, that uh, you've seen in past Israeli leaders that par were party to positive breakthroughs uh, in the Arab-Israeli conflict. It wasn't just Sadat in the late 70s. It was also Begin, uh, who had the sense of leadership and theatrics that allowed Israel to respond the way it responded. It wasn't just Arafat in Oslo, it was also Rabin, with his military credibility, but also his willingness to, to make a complete about face uh, and sign the Oslo agreements with the PLO that he deemed for the previous 30 years was a terrorist organization. And it's the same bulldozer called Sharon that unfortunately took Israel in the wrong direction, both in Lebanon and in the settlement construction project but because he had this strong personality, could also take the different uh, direction and take Israel out of Gaza in 2005. Uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I doubt uh, that uh, Netanyahu has what it takes to make, uh, to make that change. Uh, so what I just wanted to do is give you a sh very short um, telegraphic example of how do we apply <laughs> this kind of analytical framework to try to understand what happened in the past, what's happening now, and to say something maybe about the future uh, that is more um, intelligent than your average op-ed. Thank you. Oh, sure.
Pocket. Thank you very much for coming to hear us. Um, from what Shai said, <clears throat> I would understand that basically Shai is saying, do not expect Do not expect good things to happen in Palestinian-Israeli relations. And I'm going to make it a little tougher. I would say expect Israeli-Palestinian relations to worsen. So I <clears throat> will be making the case for why um, the future after the Gaza war is looking grim and why things will probably take a wrong turn. I, I don't know when. Um, I, I will not say the Palestinians uh, and the Israelis are about to enter a third intifada because we, I, I, I doubt very much that there will be anything similar to what happened in the second intifada. Um, there might be something similar to the first intifada, um, but it might be a little worse than that. So. I don't know exactly what will happen, so I cannot really define that likely outcome. If the three of us are writing a new chapter in the book, therefore, I, I would not know what the title would be. Um, but it would be something bad. It would be that things will actually worsen. It's not that, that the set, in other words, the status quo is untenable, and the status quo is not about failure of Israelis and Palestinians to reach, to make progress or reach agreements. But the future, it seems to me, is one where there is a growing tension, uh, an escalation in the violence, and perhaps even something larger than that. So why would that be happening? And, and why, what is the relationship between this outcome and the Gaza war? Uh, I agree with Shai that at the international level, the international community is more or less uh, withdrawing from the scene. Um, despite the Gaza war, it doesn't, and, and despite the short-term international engagement as uh, to bring about a ceasefire and to bring about some effort to begin reconstruction in Gaza, I think the international community is indeed withdrawing. <clears throat> the only development at the international level where the Gaza war might have contributed is the growing international interest in some places, not everywhere, uh, in some places, particularly in Europe, where there is a growing interest in finding ways to punish Israel by doing things about settlements. Uh, boycotts of some sort uh, is something that I see continuing and giving comfort to Palestinians who uh, want to wage a, a, an internationally supported campaign of some sort. Um, when I come to the conclusion, you'll see the importance of this element uh, to that Palestinian effort. But it's essentially a, 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 some, a, 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 another way of saying it is those Palestinians who believe that uh, what is on the ground today in the West Bank and Gaza is a one-state reality, would like to describe this reality as a system of apartheid that Palestinians therefore should wage a war against and demand one man, one vote. Um, this is part of my conclusion, but this is where I see the, this development at the international level, the rising interest in the international community Again, not everywhere, and it's not really something that is uh, it's no bowling or anything, but, but there is no doubt that there is a growing interest in, a, in the boycott movement. Um, I was recently in Europe. I went to Oslo to, to talk to people and, and to governments, and I found, uh, indeed, there is, uh, well, Norway in particular, of course, is, has been leading in the effort to try and get the Europeans to try and do something about the settlements. Uh, there is indeed, uh, I, I, I can confirm my own suspicion that there is indeed an interest, but I can also confirm that this interest is not 
uh, uh, something that will be dramatic uh, anytime soon. At the regional level, w the, the region has also been withdrawing, by the way, as you probably know, since 2011, we had something called the Arab Spring, and after that, we had uh, the, all the problems that are associated with the Arab Spring, including the rise of political Islam in the region, uh, and, and most recently, one expression <coughs> of this political Islam, of course, has been uh, uh, the, uh, violent extremism in the form of ISIS and others. The region, at the moment, is not looking at the Arab-Israeli conflict. The region is looking at that picture. Uh, they are really preoccupied with it. Um, this is uh, pretty much similar to where we were in 87, when the first intifada erupted, when Palestinians looked around and found everyone is looking elsewhere and decided they need to take matters into their own hands, we are in a similar situation. For a while, the Palestinians have been saying to themselves, we have to rely on ourselves, we have to do things ourselves. And um, this, I believe, is, is uh, perhaps something that might, ha might have an indirect effect on where Palestinians will go. Now, I agree with Shai that it, it, this development gives Israel a role, if Israel wants to play that role in the region. For the first time since the creation of the State of Israel, the situation uh, it is developing in a way that provides a great deal of common interest for Israel and the major Arab states. If Israel wants to take advantage of this opportunity, uh, I think the road is pretty open. Uh, the, it, Israel will find very little resistance in the region um, including from the masses, if it decides it wants to be part of the regional interest in combating extremism, uh, and, and, but, but the region will definitely demand a price. <coughs> Without Israel paying a price for integration in the region, becoming a major uh, uh, ally, in fact, quote unquote, uh, of the major Arab states without resolving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, those Arab states will not be able to forge such an alliance. But the opportunity for something like this happening is definitely out there. So at the systemic and regional level, there is no doubt that it, it doesn't at this point seem uh, that the, the, the system or the region are really pushing towards a very clear outcome. With the exception of the opportunity provided to Israel, uh, there isn't much else that is out there at this level that is pushing for this or that outcome. Um, now, turning to the domestic level, I'm not going to talk about the Israeli side, but I, I share Shai's belief that uh, domestically, Israel is not prepared uh, to take advantage of the opportunity. And, and this basically <coughs> neutralizes that regional uh, environment uh, from playing that, the positive role that one would envisage for the region um, if Israel was in a, a position to take advantage of it. That brings me then to the domestic environment on the Palestinian side. And this is where I think the Gaza war had the most dramatic impact. The first and, and, and most important impact, which I think is basically fueling the move uh, that I think we are about to take, Israelis and Palestinians, that is to, uh, for the confrontation between the two sides to take a more violent turn, Again, not, not really big explosion of violence, but more violent than it is today, is the fact that it radicalized the Palestinians. The Gaza war has radicalized Palestinians in ways we have not seen before at any time before. Um, it, it did so in three ways. It dramatically changed the domestic balance of power. Uh, it uh, uh, gave the Islamists, uh, Hamas, in particular, a great deal of, of public support. There has been a shift in public opinion uh, favoring Hamas, a, 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 and it's a massive shift, something that, as I said, we have not seen before. The nationalists, <coughs> have, the, the nationalist Falah, which is the mainstream nationalist uh, movement, have lost con considerable public support as a result of the war. 
Hamas's popularity skyrocketed. The popularity of Hamas leaders have also skyrocketed to unprecedented levels. The popularity of nationalist Fatah leaders <coughs> have dramatically plummeted to levels we have never seen before. Um, this is a temporary development, no doubt about it. But it will, and things will certainly change in the future. We've seen this happening with the previous two wars, and it is happening with this war in six months or so. Um, maybe, maybe, if one is to uh, believe the, the, the other, the previous trends will uh, uh, recur here. Um, maybe we will see uh, things returning back, but it's possible that they may not, and it's also possible that uh, the, the, the change will have some residual impact, and it's also possible that while it lasts, it will trigger some of these outcomes that I've described earlier. Uh, the, the second most important element of this radicalization is the change in attitudes with regard to the role of violence in the conflict between Palestinians and Israelis. Before the war, only a minority of Palestinians in the West Bank, that minority was about 25%, believed that violence pays, believed that to resolve a conflict with Israel, Palestinians must resort to violence. So this is the only language the Israelis understand. After the war, this 25% became 75%. Now, um, and, and, it, and, and this trend was uh, strengthened by other trends, including trends, questions that are asked in surveys about whose way is the best way to move forward? Is it Abbas's way, the nationalist mainstream way of negotiations, diplomacy, and so on, or Hamas's way of violence, confrontation, and so on? And the answer uh, in the past was basically a tie between the two. And now there is absolutely no doubt that the public is moving towards Hamas's way. People have, have, have no re reluctance to say that they believe that Hamas's way is the best way to go. In part, this is about the narrative that Hamas has successfully managed to present to the public. The public is definitely buying into the Hamas victory. 90% of the Palestinians immediately after the war believed Hamas won the war. Um, the Israeli leaders have actually participated in creating this narrative. Israeli chief of staff, Israeli prime minister, Israeli defense minister, all three of them, in fact, uh, if you are a Palestinian, you, have read, you would have read during the past few months statements by these leaders to the effect that Israel didn't want to continue this war because it was paying a very uh, heavy cost that Hamas was inflicting uh, on them, that Israel cannot go after Hamas uh, or destroy Hamas, that the cost would be prohibitive that the situation left in Gaza would be such that it would be much worse for Israel than it is when this war started. Hamas believes, therefore, that it has today a deterrent capacity. It can deter Israel from doing things, and the Palestinian public buys into this narrative. This, therefore, strengthens the view that Hamas has something to bargain with, while the nationalists do not. Hamas has leverage while the nationalists do not. This, uh, again, strengthens the trend that will say to Palestinians, we need to do something. And that something, at this point, seems to be, uh, uh, must be violent. Uh, the third change, domestically, is the change in, in, in the public willingness to accept compromise with Israel. There is a growing uh, opposition to compromises that five years ago, even 10 years ago, there was strong public support for. Uh, regular surveys have shown, uh, among Palestinians have shown, a clear trend toward moderation for a long time. Um, during the last few years, we have seen a reversal of these trends, but uh, immediately after the Gaza war, we saw very clear change in the opposite direction, where, with Palestinians showing um, I must say that, the, the, by the way, these surveys are also conduct, conducted among Israelis, and they do also so, uh, show the same trend. The reason I'm bringing Israel into this picture is because this is an issue about negotiations, and whether uh, 
uh, the, 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 the two communities, the Israeli and the Palestinians, uh, are ready or willing to compromise. This is not a good time for the Israelis and the Palestinians. At this point, they, do, they, they have never been as distrustful of each other as they are now. They have never been as ignorant of each other as they are now. And they are much less willing to compromise today than the two communities than they were before, which once again, the, the, the importance here is that this means uh, on, on both sides, well, no, let me say just on the Palestinian side, there will therefore be a, a, a search for an alternative way of changing things. And this, uh, I believe, will be in part uh, a turn to violence. Um, there are many other things that I can say about the domestic environment and the impact uh, of Gaza, but I, I, I realize that Minam is looking at his watch too, and he, he's... <laughs> He has to say, uh, uh, he has to take, uh, to make his uh, contribution to this discussion today. Um, so let me jump to the third issue uh, that we look at, uh, as Shai indicated, which is the, the leaders, the individuals. And, you know, when, when, when we look at 100 years of conflict, and in this book we selected something like 15 to 20 major turning points. Uh, in the history of the conflict. And we've looked as, at the question of why they ha have happened, what made them possible. In some cases, it wasn't something at the international or regional level. It wasn't something at the domestic level. Uh, these two levels were sort of permissive. They weren't pushing or pulling in this or that direction. But it was the individual. The individual was the, the person who, in fact, pushed or pulled in this or that direction. And, and we know some of the individuals that Chai have mentioned certainly made a difference. Is Abbas and Netanyahu? Well, let me talk about Abbas. Is Abbas that kind? No. He is not that. He is not going to make a difference. Of, in fact, Abbas's legitimacy is deteriorating. The Gaza war as I said, has in fact uh, uh, diminished his legitimacy uh, considerably. Uh, his popularity has gone down. His ability to say no to strong and radical forces uh, among <coughs> Palestinians, but most importantly within Farah, his, his own political party uh, has diminished considerably. His move to the UN, the change in the language that he uses, is something that reflects his own recognition of his diminished legitimacy and his incapacity to lead towards anything that would substantially present the Palestinians with uh, a, a, a shift that would also be something acceptable to the other side. The other side <coughs> is a right-wing coalition led by Netanyahu. I just can't imagine something uh, useful coming out uh, from the, these two leaders, Abbas and Netanyahu. I, I, the, the, what I expect, therefore, is not a leadership on the part of Abbas, but lack of it. And lack of it will create these uh, dynamics. And these dynamics will go in two ways. I've already alluded to the first one, and that is the move towards a one-state solution. The move toward the one-state solution is not something that has a great deal of popular support, but it, and indeed it is a minority view among Palestinians. But it is the view of the youth. It is the, the, the youth and the educated among Palestinians are turning to the one-state solution. They think the two-state solution is simply not workable. They oppose it, in fact. Those Palestinians who are between today between the ages of 18 and 39, this is half of the adult population, today says one state solution, uh, it, and in fact is opposed to a two state solution. They, they, there is no major, there's no majority among them for a one state solution, but a majority is indeed opposed to a two state solution among this uh, 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 age group. They, and so they will, <coughs> they will become stronger because they are motivated and I think the more it becomes clear that this, the current one state reality, uh, as they would describe it, it, becomes more and more consolidated, they will be more and more energized. And they 
will find comfort in the fact that there is a growing international movement to support a boycott movement that they uh, are proposing. And <clears throat> some Palestinians, therefore, I believe, will be going in that direction. Other Palestinians, I believe, will be going in the direction I described earlier, which is violence. Uh, there are triggers to the violence other than the general environment that I've described, part of it I haven't. Uh, those triggers sometimes are related to holy places. What is happening in Jerusalem today is certainly one of those flashing points. So far, we haven't yet had a major explosion there, but um, this is definitely one of those places where something like this could happen. Uh, there has been gradual escalation uh, f during the, the, the past four months since the kidnapping of three Israeli kids um, by H Hamas, uh, uh, a Hamas cell in the West Bank, and followed by the Gaza War, uh, the, uh, uh, the kidnapping of a Palestinian, burning him alive by, by Israeli right-wingers, and a series of other events that are currently moving in a direction. Again, I don't see a snowball effect. I don't see this becoming, the, 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 we do not have data that indicates that this is something that will indeed snowball tomorrow. But, it, but there are indications that people are losing hope in diplomacy. They are becoming more convinced that violence is the way to go. They are more convinced that Israel will never give up control over the West Bank without Palestinians imposing very serious costs on the Israelis. And they are convinced, many of them are convinced that a two-state solution is not workable. For all these reasons, I, I would say the future looks grim and could become violent. It's a great pleasure to be here. That's my first time in, in Michigan, so I'm, I'm honored to be here and honored to, to talk to you. And honored more to differ with my uh, colleagues in, uh, in, in, in the Crown Center and in doing that great book uh, that we did. I hope that uh, you know after six years we feel uh, a, a kind of camaraderie that makes us uh, capable of, uh, of differing with each other. And uh, my case is the following, that uh, you know, if we learned anything from the study of the Arab-Israeli conflict, we learned that it is a very resilient conflict. Uh, it is capable of adapting to, an, to a lot of, of international and regional system from colonization to decolonization to Cold War, post-Cold War, American uh, unilateral dominance of, of the universe, the post-September 11th world, and, and so on. Every configuration we get in the world or in the region, the, the conflict continued. Uh, and uh, with, with capability to attract attention now and then, with a war, if, uh, if not in, uh, with Palestine, it is with Lebanon, uh, or with anybody uh, else. However, not only the adaptability is happening, but also the ability to change things. Things don't stay the same, and sometimes we get achievements from the middle of the dark of darkness that we have. I mean, I can make a case that the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty could not have happened because uh, uh, if we looked at the conflict as a beauty contest in which we ask people, did you hate each other? They will tell us we hate each other. You know, uh, If we talked with a politician, and uh, the politician will try to always maximize you know, uh, the, the interest of his country, so usually he play his domestic politics. Uh, if, if, we, if we looked at it as, you know, the situation in the world or in the region is collapsing, 
Well, it has been a lot of collapsing times. I mean, the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty happened after what? 1973 war, the rise in oil prices, and then there was, you know, you know, the, you know, in the middle of the invasion of Afghanistan and of, by the Soviet Union, I mean, it was very dark times. Yet there was a peace treaty and there was negotiations. Uh, can we imagine what happened in the 1990s with Madrid, Oslo, and uh, Jordanian-Israeli peace treaty after one of the biggest wars in the region, uh, the, the, the war in which more than a half a million soldiers and hundreds of planes and a lot of people died. Uh, you know, I, I believe that, you know, uh, that uh, we cannot judge from the beginning that the situation is difficult because it is always difficult. It has to be difficult. And this time, probably it's more difficult than others. And I am talking about the future and also the, the Arab-Israeli conflict because when it comes, you know, very become very difficult, <coughs> probably we will have always a lot of risks that it can get worse. And sometimes getting it worse in itself is one of the bushers to make it uh, uh, an, uh, an opportunity to look for a solution to the situation we are living in. And even in the middle of what we have, we will find some glimpses of much more reconciliation as I will represent. The Middle East and particularly Arab countries went into a furnace, you know, like all countries for about three, four years, get into a furnace of revolutions. Revolutions is a very serious matter, usually is accompanied by violence and people's expectations go high. Romanticism is mixed with, with blood and mixed with a lot of uh, clashes. And let me evaluate the situation in, in, in the, our region in, in four terms. All of them are difficult. Number one is the state. Number two is power in terms of authority. And then the balance of power in the region. And third, the agenda. What do we have? And probably I, I, will, I will show you that it is not pleasant at all. But inside that unpleasantness, we probably will find some lights that I think it might help us in the future if we are not only, you know, uh, uh, keeping saying what is, you know, uh, uh, we have accustomed to over the past uh, century or, or more. The state is a challenge. And probably it is irony now that Palestinians want to make a state in a time that the state in, in, in the Middle East, uh, many countries, uh, I don't think that any country can be getting the case of stateness like Egypt. And it has been seriously weakened in the past four years. The state has been challenged by non-state actors. Non-state actors are not trade unions, are not pressure groups. Non-state actors are those who carry arm and question the ability of the state to be the only having the monopoly of force in the country. The state is not there you know, in many cases weakened and sometimes it's destroyed uh, in, 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 in its capacity to use uh, force are contested <coughs> by, by, by others. Also it's con contested by civil society organization. Not because we have certain organizations of human rights or of, 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 uh, of people who are getting together to express their own interests, no. We are talking about now civil society that is, in essence, global. You know, it is, it is in, in an alliance with its similar people in the West, in Europe, and probably other the, in the region. So it is weakening the state because it is challenging the functions of, of the state. I will say that also the media. The media is not only to inform anymore in the region, it is a political actor that is getting also to, you know, once I asked one of our ministers during Mubarak's time, if you, if you give me one reason why Mubarak regime collapsed, and he told me the media. The media succeeded to delegitimize the regime, and with it delegitimizing, a state that was built uh, over uh, decades. So number one, 
reality is the environment is the state is weakened or collapsed. I mean, look at, uh, at uh, Libya today, <coughs> Syria today, Yemen today, you will find a state of collapsing state. Then we talk about power. You know, power is who rules countries, who is really getting the ability to change things in, in, in uh, 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 I will say that we witnessed in the past four years four patterns of behavior, you know, that affect seriously, you know, the powers of that control the state. Number one, that the Arab Spring was not as peaceful and as romantic and as nice as people think outside. Uh, it was after a few days we get violent and sometimes extremely violent. And what is, you know, started with good slogans, noble ones, ended with using uh, 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 not only cocktail molotovs, but sometimes <coughs> RPGs and the rest. So the idea of Selmiya, of being peaceful, uh, uh, the Arab Spring was really full, full of sandstorms. You know, you know, those who know the Middle East know that we have a lot of chemicals over there. Second pattern we get, that the revolution ended to be very backward. I mean, most revolutions got progressive goals. Imagine the American Revolution, the French Revolution, got progressive goals in terms of how to upgrade, you know, the lives of people. We got the Muslim Brothers to power. Our Muslim Brothers, by any judgment, is a very conservative political group. And it has, uh, you know, particularly those who are belonging to Said Qutb, they got into a kind of being very violent. Uh, some of them are moderate, but a lot of them also very violent. But at the end, their agenda was to make religious constitutions. I mean, the, the constitution made by the Muslim Brothers in Egypt in 2012 was really a, a religious, <coughs> making a religious state out of the Egyptian uh, state. But that was not the case. Yeah, Muslim brothers were, you know, in the rise of Muslim brothers in Tunisia. They were in, 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 in Libya. They were in Yemen. And their behavior in general, and even they got into elections in, in, in Morocco and influenced that street in, Jor in Jordan. Uh, so they have been there into the politics using all kinds of political and sometimes non-political uh, pressure and led to the upgrading in a ladder of Islamism from the Muslim Brothers to the ISIL that we have it today. The third pattern was is the re-rise of the army. At the end, in that kind of political turmoil that we have in the, in the region, we will find that the armies were almost the remaining powers that remained in countries like Libya, like Egypt, and, 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 and like even in Yemen, uh, uh, they, they, they were there. So armies came back and succeeded with help of circumstances, including uh, uprising from the people to, to get back to the power. What was surprising in the whole endeavor of the four years was number one, <coughs> number four, the fourth pattern, which is that the monarchies were very resilient. They stood the times. They stood the times, the monarchies of the Gulf, Jordan, Morocco, uh, uh, they faced the, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, the power of revolutions like in Bahrain, uh, the, in, in Morocco there was, in Jordan there was, in Saudi Arabia there was. However, they stood themselves, <coughs> sometimes through refor reform and sometimes through uh, use of uh, 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 firm power and force. The balance of power in the region uh, uh, is ending after four years of revolution that there is no revolution anymore. Actually, you know, uh, uh, every public opinion poll that we have in the region that people are now, you know, crying for stability, for, you know, end of violence and back to normalcy. And I will say that there was also 
uh, an attempt that started to work out to start to counter these revolutions by uh, uh, building a kind of alliance. If we got uh, you know, historical analogies, I know that they are very imperfect, and rightly so. However, I found that there is certain similarity between what happened in Europe after the French Revolution with the rise of the Concert of Europe, a rise in, in the Middle East of something I will call Concert of Arabia that use oil and use money of oil and also arms to face the revolutionary endeavor of the region uh, in, in the past four years. I will end by here the changes taking place by the agenda in the region, what these four years are putting as an agenda for now and for the near future. Number one, I will say that the restoration of the state is number one priority now in all the countries of the region. I mean by the restoration of the state, I remember uh, uh, in two ways. One, through you know, uh, uh, another revolution or counter-revolution or whatever you call it, or through elections. I mean, basically the Nida Tunis, the party that won the elections in Tunisia, is Zain al Abidim bin Ali people, uh, or the majority of them at least, uh, with a legacy over, over there. So restoration of the state is, is extremely uh, uh, on the table right now. Number two on the agenda, most constitutions and the debates about them, whether they are in Egypt or in Tunisia or in Morocco or in Yemen, put the idea of religion and the state. That's something, one of the big dilemmas that we are faced in, in the Middle East, and the Arab Middle East in particular, <coughs> probably in the past 80 years or so. Uh, we failed, like you know, it happened in, in the West and in Europe, to face this issue. What is the relationship between religion and the state, religion and society? Major uh, questions that kept hanging, and I think now they are faced, and there were, uh, we got formulas to deal with them in the constitution that already done, like in Tunisia or like in, in, in Egypt. Number three, I think, in the table on the agenda is military civic relations. And no place this kind of how to, to make the balance and strike the right balance like in, in a state like in, in Egypt. There are other issues on the agenda like political and other economic reforms. What this, all this, you know, the state, the power, the balance of power and the agenda that I mentioned affect the Arab-Israeli conflict that we have. Uh, I will say that we have two uh, equations here. One belongs to Israel and one belongs to the Palestinians. That paradoxical in, in many ways. It got to be resolved. Israel cannot live in the region in peace with occupation in the same time. If we learn it from the book, if we learn it from our recent history, that peace and occupation does not go together. Another thing we know also for the Palestinians is violence and having a state does not go together, particularly if the violence is happening from variety of groups. You know, if Hamas stopped sending uh, rockets, Jihad will, will, will do the job. If both are silenced, probably uh, uh, some people in Fatah will do it. You know, you can't have no monopoly on the use of force and have a state in the same time. That is that's something, uh, you know, that is contradictory to, 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 to do. So there's something paradoxical here. And a just what the Palestinians and both with the Israelis got to solve the idea of a relationship that is happening in which there is a colonization happening under the condition of proximity. We are not getting the British or the French or anybody that's coming to occupy somebody else's land. It is they are, you know, living like it or not with each other in the same area. 
And the proximity has a lot of consequences, strategic, military, and, 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 and societal in the same time. So uh, here, for, for both sides, you know, they, they can look at the situation we have in and say that everything is disparate, everything cannot lead to a better future. I believe something that there is there. There is a number of issues that, that is, uh, uh, carry opportunity. The risk we know, risk is chaos, risk is another war, risk is another violence. We know the risk that's happening. But the opportunity here, that's, that is the idea of restoration of states that will meet, make Israel learn that it will be better off having a Palestinian <coughs> state than not having a Palestinian state. Because on, the only thing that can minimize the violence here is to have a state, <coughs> to have somebody uh, with a monopoly on the use of force and with a monopoly of controlling the crossing points with Gaza, with Gaza, with a monopoly over the idea of how to represent yourself <coughs> to the outside world. <coughs> so the idea here is to, to turn what's happening now from being a total risk into a total opportunity, that the restoration of the strength of the state leads, I believe, into the idea of acceptance of a Palestinian uh, uh, state or the two-state solution. Another opportunity that is there, that is what I said, that the monarchies are creating what I called it the Concert of Arabia. Here I will see some congruence between Israeli national interests, strategic interests, and many of Arab countries. Now, who, in terms of the priorities that is taking place, that like is immediately we got the example when the United States of America having an alliance with the Soviet Union to defeat the fascism of, 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 Germany, of Italy and the Nazism of, of Germany. Having ISIS in the region, having these kind of fascist groups in the region, I think create a common enemy that require that all in the agenda between the allies or between those who are want at the end to live in the region is to get there. Number three opportunity, which I see it coming <coughs> into glimpses, you know, is that, that now we have both sides are talking about the Arab Peace Initiative. If you don't remember, I remind you that Saudi Arabia represented in the Arab Summit of 2002 you know, an initiative in which it exactly goes in a simple way. Israel withdrew to the 1967 line, and then the whole entire Arab country with the Arab League will, will normalize and accepting Israel into the Middle East. Prince Turki al Faisal uh, 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 said with the head, an ex Israeli head of intelligence in Belgium lately, and Post talked about the Arab initiative. Uh, uh, more than 100 Israeli generals wrote a, a statement in which criticizing uh, Netanyahu for not responding positively to the Arab Peace uh, Initiative. So I believe that there is in the middle of all this that we have it imposed on, on, on the Arab side and also on the Israeli side, uh, 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 a kind of, of, of rapprochement that, that's happening around certain kinds of of goals. Will that work with Netanyahu or not? I don't know. If somebody asked me in 1977 that an, any Egyptian initiative will work with Begin or not, I don't know. At the time, by the way, public opinion polls in Israel told us that 90% of Israelis prefer not to withdraw from Sinai over the idea of having peace with Egypt. Moshe Dayan said, you know, War with, with, with Sharm Sheikh is better for Israel than peace without Sharm Sheikh. Sharm Sheikh is a tiny little nice city, uh, Egyptian city in Sinai. So, you know, I, I believe that, you know, um, <coughs> if the darkness in, in the Middle East and the difficult times in the Middle East will take us to the idea that it's hopeless, I disagree. I think, you know, Always, you know, opportunities come 
when circumstances are very difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those excellent presentations. Um, we're grateful also for the many questions we've received from the audience. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, Morteza and Ceci uh, have gone through the questions and have tried to distill from the numerous questions that you've submitted uh, some key themes and to combine questions where appropriate uh, since we've only got time for several questions. I'll ask the panelists, if you don't mind, to take the questions uh, from, from your table uh, and I will then hand the microphone over now to Morteza and Ceci to begin. I'm Morteza Nazari. I'm a second year graduate student at the Ford School of Public Policy. So we have had a couple of questions on the regional interactions affecting the conflict in, uh, between uh, Israel and, uh, and Palestine. And uh, the first issue is Iran and how you think the, that the Israeli-Iranian relations and conflict is, is to some extent like exacerbating this conflict going on there or affecting it from another like perspectives and and how do you think the resolving of nuclear dispute or any nuclear problem will affect uh, this situation the other side of these questions is about like how uh, the anti-israeli posture of arabian countries legitimize their own like uh, public gestures and how, how they need it for their public support. And as they are invested in this conflict, why they should contribute to solving it? So that's it. Okay. Um, on the first one, uh, Iran actually in, in, in many ways in the context that we've been discussing is, is it belongs to uh, what Abdul Munim talks about, the opportunity. Because, uh, because Iran poses a threat to Israel, but it also poses a threat to a number of the region's uh, states, primarily Saudi Arabia and some of the smaller Gulf, uh, Gulf states. So in terms of charting those common interests, that uh, the Muni uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, Iran actually plays, <laughs> in, a, in many ways, it plays a positive role. Uh, uh, now, however, as the Muni said, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and um, as was the case, uh, the case was made clear uh, in uh, by uh, people like uh, Prince Turki of Faisal. Uh, for this um, potential alliance to become an alliance, uh, Israel has to do certain things, primarily from the Saudi standpoint, except the Arab Peace Initiative, which the Saudis, for good reason, see actually as the Saudi Peace Initiative. Uh, so Iran, I think, on, is, is uh, in that sense, uh, in, in the context of Israel, uh, of, of, uh, of, of creating a, a kind of Israel that's gets out of the isolation uh, that presents an opportunity for Israel, uh, Iran uh, plays also, I would say, also a positive role. Uh, of course, Iran has also played a negative role in the conflict in the sense that it supported and continues to support uh, groups that don't accept Israel's existence. And that means that, and that's on the negative side, because as long as Israel faces non-state actors that, are, that remain committed to essentially Israel's destruction, whether it's Hamas, Islamic Jihad, or Hezbollah, then Israel continues to see this conflict as existential. Then all these questions about giving Hamas some way out, whether it has to do with opening the crossing points and so on, is all seen through this prism of a conflict that still has this existential component because these movements don't accept Israel's, uh, Israel's right uh, to, uh, to exist. Um, and the second question, remind me, was about... It was 
about? It was about anti-Israeli posture of Arabian countries yeah. and how. Well, actually, uh, the the what what the, what is referred to as the anti-Israeli posture of Arab countries has, of course, changed dramatically because. Again, because of all the reasons we mentioned earlier, which is um, to use Abdul Munin's uh, fourth element, which is the agenda of the region. Israel is in a different place in that agenda today. Uh, and that doesn't mean that sympathy in the uh, in populations have changed. It doesn't mean that uh, is, Arabs are less sympathetic towards the Palestinians. But the kind of, uh, let's say, virulent <coughs> anti-Arab, anti-Israeli um, uh, drivers that you see in previous periods of the conflict is simply not, is simply uh, has a different weight because of these other issues on the Middle East agenda that compete with the, with the hatred of Israel part of the agenda. Uh, and so I think that, you know, if, uh, this of course explains why why uh, somebody like Prince Turki or Faisal would go publicly? I mean, can you imagine 20, 30 years ago when Israel's role in the Arab, broader Arab agenda was where it was, that the former head of the Saudi security services, former ambassador in Washington, the UK, for, and a member of the, of the royal family, would appear in a public forum in Brussels with the former head of the Israeli military intelligence. I can't imagine something like that happening 20, uh, 20 years ago, given public opinion uh, in the Arab world uh, then. And there will be another forum. And in, ne in, a, in the next few days, there will be a forum at Harvard with the same uh, Prince Turki of Faisal with a former deputy prime minister of Israel and head and, and minister in charge of the Israeli intelligence system. Uh, Dan Meridor, another public forum. These are all signals that the Saudis are sending, which are inconceivable, it would have been inconceivable 20 years ago. You could me say something on, on, on this, you know. Uh, if you lived in the United States as I did during difficult, different times, you would find that the Cold War was yeah. one of the things that's uh, used by American politicians in every elections. Uh, that didn't mean, you know, that later on to have a dialogue with, with the Soviets over a, a variety of issues. And so the issues that uh, pertain to, you know, domestic situation and domestic passions yeah, are, are part of, of the political nature of, of leaders. But certainly the region is changing, and part of it is if, if, if the Iranians succeeded to have an agreement with the Americans, that would mean that we will reduce the nuclear tension. And for the Arab purpose here is to turn on the Israelis why you are keeping your nuclear weapons if everybody else is, is now is standing down on that kind of an arms race. So uh, I think if, if, if there is you know, something that will come of that, it will reduce a notch from the heat in, 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 the, in the region, even the, a notch from the heat with, with Iran and Arab countries who are afraid of both religious, revolutionary power owning nuclear weapons. That's, that is a very lethal combination. And, uh, you know, I don't think that Arab countries or any country in the world is immune from, you know, public hyperboling in, in terms of you know, dealing with, with any sort of, uh, of adversary. Uh, let me just say shortly that I, I agree with what I have just heard, but I would actually add that the, the international community's engagement with Iran is actually playing a positive role. Uh, the Iranian policy has changed. The Iranians take the Gaza war. During the Gaza war, the group that has been most loyal to Iran, Islamic Jihad, and actually been playing the most positive role in bringing about the ceasefire and has been a lot more willing to work with the Egyptians and the international community than we have seen it acting at any time before. The Iranians seem to have an interest in reaching a deal with the international community on the nuclear issue 
And if they do indeed reach one, they will have an interest in keeping that deal and keeping the international community working with them. And it has, of course, something to do with the nature of the regime in Iran, the, the, the little change that is taking place. But the, the Iranians have essentially decided yeah. that is in their national interest. The Palestinian question, therefore, is taking <clears throat> is, is no longer being used by the Iranians. And, and the truth is, for, for, the, for those who have asked about the Arab countries, the Arab countries are now fighting groups that are using the Palestinian question to agitate against the Arab countries. So this is a dramatic shift from the era of revolutionary Arabs in the 50s and 60s, uh, the period of the Cold War, and, and this is a dramatic change that, in fact, that is why we've concluded that the, the, the regional environment is permissive. It certainly is, is not pushing, but it is permissive to the kind of uh, uh, agenda, a peace agenda between Palestinians and Israelis uh, than we have seen in previous times. My name is, my name is Ceci Burns. I'm a second year MPP. And um, I'm going to give you a couple of questions to finish out, if you could take about two minutes each to respond to whichever part you would like to. Um, we had several questions on optimism and uh, what you see as the most optimistic outcome in the next couple of years, specifically um, also long term, um, and particularly whether there are any leaders that you see as, as an up and coming um, potential for this optimistic outcome. And then uh, several questions also relating to the two-state solution versus a um, binational single-state solution and what you see as the, again, I guess, the most optimistic um, route to take. Um, maybe I'm gonna, I should answer the question about optimism. He has been the most optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, rather than depress you more, maybe I'm going to should be. If there is any one single positive thing out of the Arab Spring phenomenon is that people are there participating in, in, in politics again. So uh, no one will take them to war, no one will take them to peace, no one will take them to any road without uh, a, 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 you know, a kind of, of a consent of the populace or they will come back to the streets. I mean, knowing where Tahrir Square is, is one of the most positive elements, but people and sometimes, you know, the population, they are, uh, 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 can, can get manipulated. However, there is much more maturity, I will say, I will say, in evaluating politics. There is a sense of accountability as well, in terms of rulers, save none, uh, including, uh, and I, you know, I've, I've been working in, in dealing with, with, with the monarchies that, that you know, saved by this storm. But I know very well that every policy that they are now contemplating will, will have to think it over and over because they will uh, you know, uh, uh, measure how much support it will be. Particularly with issues that are very sensitive, like state and religion, as I said, civic, military, and, and other uh, issues. I think that's the most optimistic, I will say, outcome in, in you know, people who say that we will get back to where we were. No, we want, we will get back to where we were in terms of having a state, having an order. However, not the old order, but I think a new order that I think probably will be much better than the one we had before. I'll, I'll just share with you my, um, <coughs> Uh, when I when I look hard for uh, for for sources of optimism <coughs> is the following uh, in again in this arena or or situation where the the international or global level doesn't seem to provide uh, sources of hope that something positive will dramatically change uh, in the next uh, few years. Uh, and the region pr provides this mix of threats and opportunities, uh, it really falls down to this question of where do these domestic scenes go and the interaction between leadership and the domestic scenes, which is actually the crux of this question, do we see uh, leaders coming up? And, 
And, uh, and the reason I, I'm a little bit more optimistic about uh, this level of uh, domestic uh, is the following. My own view is that uh, Israeli, in a, in a way, uh, the Israeli contribution uh, to the lack of resolving this conflict until now has been not because Israel has a majority of people who are ideologically, religiously committed to preventing peace from coming about. The problem has been that the minority, the 20-25% who are committed for religious and ideological reasons, have been tolerated by the center of the map that actually disagrees with those 25% that still uh, that have still been until at least until the last polls that Khalil ran with uh, some of his colleagues in Israel shown that there are still those 65 to 70 something percent who support the two-state solution. But those 50% in the middle of the map have essentially been passive, uh, immobile, uh, they've been at home. Uh, it's a combination of all the changes from Rabin's assassination to the, next, to the second intifada, which caused them to essentially become indifferent or apathetic and allowed those 20% essentially to dictate the agenda, especially with respect to settlement construction. Now I think that the, what, what Abdulmoni mentioned a few minutes ago is the beginning of a wake-up call. When you have 106 former generals, 106 former generals from the, both the Israeli Defense Forces and the Police Forces, are basically telling the Israeli Prime Minister, excuse me, we have an opportunity here. Okay, listen to what the Arabs are saying. Listen to the Arab, read the Arab Peace Initiative. They specifically refer to a very important speech that the new president of Egypt, uh, El Sisi, gave a few weeks ago and said, we, the president of Egypt provides you an opportunity. Why are you not responding? And I think that if, if that becomes like the first, a first sign of essentially the center of the map waking up from a long, long uh, period of sleep, if you wish, um, I think that that's, uh, that's very important. And it's important particularly because, again, what's been driving, driven, driving those 50% in the middle are not ideological religious concerns, they're security fears. And the most important thing is if you have somebody who is a 30-year you know, veteran of the Israeli Defense Forces, reached the rank of Major General, one of them, you know, interviewed, said the only real security for Israel in the long range is peace. Uh, that may begin to at least <coughs> change the discourse uh, in Israel and gives me at least a source of, uh, of optimism. Uh, and that's where I would be looking for sources of optimism. <clears throat> I, I don't see a lot of uh, reason to be optimistic, but, but, but there is no doubt that, unlike previous periods, we, we had periods in which there was uh, a Cold War, and there was an Arab Cold War, and, and the international environment was very oppressive. It did not permit one to be optimistic. It is not like that today. It is. It, it does provide a permissive environment, so, but, but, it, but it's not compelling. So this is where my optimism ends, that, that the international community, the international environment, and the regional environment, and, and in fact, the regional environment, as I said earlier, as my colleagues have said, provides an opportunity. But it is the domestic uh, environment that is really oppressive. The domestic environment doesn't really look good. I am also encouraged by the letter by the 106 Israeli generals. This is a very courageous move on their part, and, and it certainly is a, a strong indicator. There are forces in Israel that are, that are really uh, worried about the direction that Netanyahu is taking the state of Israel. Um, but I, I, I don't read too much into it. The reality is Israel is actually, day after day, becoming more and more right-wing. The Israeli public is becoming more and more right-wing. 
and it is likely to continue to, to go in that direction because the Israeli demography is also moving in, in that same direction. And in, in the past, uh, we, we, when, when the situation was similar, we were saved by leaders. So, I, uh, again, I, I just don't want to depress you more, but <laughs> tell me, who is that leader? But you will depress them anyway. Who, who, who is that leader? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was a Sadat at one point, and there was Arafat and Rabin, and they can, certainly they took very courageous decisions, even though their domestic environment was not all that uh, compelling for them to move in, in that direction. And they, in fact, at times went against the, the major trends in their societies. Um, at the moment, therefore, I, I just can't find a glimpse of hope, but, but, Social science is not nuclear science. So we might all be wrong here, and, and be optimistic, please. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is a uh, a good note on which to on which to leave our discussion. I'd like you to please join me in thanking our panelists for a very rich and discussion. And if this stack of questions is any indication, you all are interested in continuing the discussion. So please start by uh, attending uh, Dr. Shikaki's talk on Friday at 11.30, and also hopefully participating in our future events uh, here at the Ford School and elsewhere on campus. Thank you very much.